Well, let's get into the word this morning. Psalm chapter 81 uh, is an interesting, it's an interesting psalm. In fact, it's kind of a sad saga of, of a people who uh, would not listen to God. <laughs> they wouldn't listen to God. In fact, uh, the compassionate uh, uh, heart of, of, of God as, as Father comes through in that psalm as God just kind of begins to, to invite his people and say, listen, I'm trying to get your attention. Listen to me. I'm trying to get your attention. I'm trying to warn you. I'm trying to tell you some things. And if you would listen, you would see that I, that I, that I, that I have some good things. I want to bless you. And uh, yet at the same time, we see over and over again a persistent uh, uh, rejection uh, of God and of not listening or hearing him. I just want to open by reading Psalm 81, starting in verse 8. And I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. And, and look at how many times the word listen to me is used. Listen to me. Or, or you have not listened to me. Look, look, look at for those words in here. Listen to me, O oh my people, while, you, while I give you stern warnings. Doesn't that sound like a parent? <laughs> o oh Israel, if you would only listen to me. You must never have a foreign God. You must not bow down before a false God. For it was I, the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it with good things. But no, my people wouldn't listen. Israel did not want me around. So I let them follow their own stubborn desires, living according to their own desires. That sounds a little like Romans chapter 1, doesn't it? Oh, that my people would listen to me. Oh, that Israel would follow me walking in my paths. How quickly I would then subdue their enemies. How soon my hands would be upon their foes. Wow. I mean, did, did you see it? Well, God as a compassionate father is saying to his people, listen to me. I am, I am wanting to talk to you. I am wanting to share something with you. If you will pay attention, if you will listen to me, I'm telling you, open your mouth and I'll fill it with good things. If you will listen to me, I'll subdue your enemies, your enemies that have you bound, your enemies that have you oppressed. If you will listen to me, I will be at work on your behalf. Listen to me. Wow. You know, I ask myself, God pleads to listen, but how many times do we not listen? How many times does God speak to us or desire to speak to us or share things or, or, or warn us or desire to speak to our hearts, but we do not listen? Perhaps God wants to lead us and guide us and comfort us or direct us, maybe convict us or warn us, but we simply are not listening. Dr. Charles Stanley in his book, How to Listen to God, makes this statement. He says, I wonder how many times God has spoken to us and we were not listening. I wonder how many times he had something specific we needed to hear, but we were too occupied to pay attention. I know I came out the gate blazing hot this morning. <laughs> nice and heavy this morning, right? But I want us to, I want us to ask ourselves, some, some, some of these questions today. How, how often does God warn us? How often does God want to speak to us? But we just simply do not listen. Last week, we, we talked about God's whisper. Today, we're going to talk about his words. And, and we discovered last week that God speaks through the whisper, the gentle whisper, or, or what is called in Scripture sometimes the KJV, the still small voice. We looked at the life of Elijah, who was a powerful prophet of God. And we said, oh, see, God speaks through powerful prophets. And yet at the same time, we also looked at 1 Kings chapter 19 that saw the very human side of Elijah. And what James 5, 17 tells us, and that is that Elijah was human as we are. And we saw the humanness of Elijah who battled despair, 
who battled depression, who, who, who battled uh, being in a place where, where he just was despondent and he was tired and he was burnt out and he had expected God to do something in a certain way, for God to speak in a certain way, for God to move in a certain way. And when that did not happen, he found himself discouraged and making his way to the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. We're in a way in which God has spoken to Israel before. Maybe he was hoping that God would show up and, 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 and empower like God had done before. Maybe that God would speak to him as God spoke to Moses, hiding him in the cleft of the rock. And so Elijah goes to the mountain of God and he finds a rock in a cave. And he hides himself in there and he hears the words, what are you doing here, Elijah? God asked him not because God didn't know why. But to kind of bring up the desires and the, the frustrations and the things that were in Elijah's heart. And then God moves in a, a great giant windstorm that comes like a tornado wind. But the Lord was not in the wind. And yet we know that in the book of Acts, God is in the wind. The very breath of God is Ruach. The wind of God, the spirit of God. But God was not in the wind. And, and then the the fire came, but God was not in the fire and the earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake, but it was the gentle whisper, the still small voice that when Elijah heard it, he came out and once again, what are you doing here, Elijah? And God began to direct Elijah's life in a different direction and how often we need to hear the whisper of God. And yet today, I also want us to recognize that available to each one of us every single day is a way in which God speaks to us on a daily basis. God speaks to us through his word. And you say, well, oh, his word. Can, can I just share with you something that I just find that, that is so powerful about his word? And, and it's not what you would expect maybe when you think about his word. Maybe we want to go to 2 Timothy and we're going to get into that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 15 through 17. All scripture is God breathed and all. And we go, I know that. But I want, to, I want to take you somewhere else just to demonstrate how powerful it is when we take God at his word. In Luke chapter 7, there's a story of one of these figures that we don't know his name. We simply know him as a centurion or a Roman centurion. He's a Roman officer. We, we don't know his name. We know who he was. We know his, that he was a Roman. We know that he was a Gentile. He was not uh, a, a, a Israel. We know that he was of considerable, a considerable rank. He, he, a centurion, he led at least a hundred uh, people that were under him. And, and Roman centurions were oftentimes given power and rulership over a particular region or area. We also know from the story that he was he had a good heart. He would be what you would consider he's a good man. In fact, the people in the story, the Israelites in the story, when he makes a request of Jesus, they go on his behalf and they, they say that. He's a good person. He's a, he's a good person. You ought you to you go to him and, and, and respond because he's a good person. Yes, he's a, he's a Gentile, but he's, a, he's a, a good person. So we know he was a good person because he, 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 he was really concerned about not only the people in his area, but about a servant in his household. And Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 2, says that at the time, the highly valued slave of a Roman officer, the Roman centurion, was sick and near death. And when the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders to ask him to come and heal his slave. Now, now that doesn't seem that uncommon. Oftentimes when people had heard about Jesus and the miracles that he did, when they had a, a need, they would, they, would, they would go and they'd want Jesus to come and Perhaps Jesus could heal. He'd done it before. Perhaps he could do it again. What we find in the story is that Jesus' response and the healing that came was not about the man being a good person. It was not about him being kind to his servant. It was not about him being a kind ruler. It wasn't about his status or his position that he was somehow, uh, you know, a leader in the government of that time. It had nothing to do with his position. Jesus wasn't particularly impressed by any of that, but he was impressed by the quality of the man's faith. And what is the quality of this man's faith? Look at verse 6. So Jesus went to them. 
But just before they arrived at the house, the officer sent some friends to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself by coming to my home. I'm not worthy of such an honor. I'm, I'm not even worthy to come and meet you. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. For I know this because I'm a man under authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say, go and they go, come and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. From his own perspective, the centurion understood something and that was he understood the authority of the word. The authority of a word. The, the person who is in authority and the word that they speak and the power in that word. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. The centurion put faith in Jesus' word. Friends, I can't tell you today how important it is for us to understand this principle that there is power in the word of God. There is power in the word of God. There is power when we put faith in the word of God. So many times, God, I can't hear you. God, are you speaking? Friends, I'm going to tell you that God has been speaking for generations upon generations upon generations. And you and I have access every day to his word. Every day, you have access to hear the voice of God through his word every day. The problem is we don't always listen. We don't receive because we do not listen. We don't open up our eyes. We don't open up our ears, even though the very word of God is in front of us. And we don't have the faith to take God at his word. Word. Therefore, we don't receive the benefits of his word. Open your mouth and I would fill it, he said in Psalm 81. If you would just do what I say, take me at my word, your enemies and your foes would be defeated before you. Verse 9, Jesus heard this. He was amazed, turning to the crowd that was following, so I tell you, I haven't even seen faith like this in Israel. Friends, God's word has power and authority. Psalm 33, 6. The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. Woo, that's power. Psalm 107, 19 and 20. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble. And he saved them from their distress. Their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, snatching them from the door of death. Some of you might need to underline some of these scriptures. You might need to underline some of these. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, right? And what did he do? How did he respond? How did he say? He sent out his word. He sent out his word. Ecclesiastes 8, 4 tells us that wherever or uh, where the word of a king is, there is power. Dallas Willard in, in his book, Hearing God, writes this. God created, God rules, and God redeems through his word. God creating, God ruling, God redeeming in his, is his word. This is the single basic truth of the, about the overall relationship that he has to his creatures. And in this truth, we see the all-encompassing mediation of Jesus, his son. If you wish, this is what Willard writes. If you wish to understand God's personal relationship to us, understand how he speaks to us individually today, we must, we must understand what the word of God is in general and how the son of God and the Bible are the word of God. Deuteronomy 8.3 Reminds us, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word, every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. It is imperative that we as believers understand the importance and the power of God's word. He speaks to us through the whisper in our heart, but every day we have access to his voice through his word. Through his word. Now God uses different means to speak. 
different means to speak. And today I want to look at three ways that God speaks to us through his word or through his words. How does God speak to us today through his word, through his words? How do we begin to understand his word and his, and his words? Number one is this, and I've been hammering on it, but it's the word of God. It's the word of God. It's scripture. The Lord's primary way of speaking to us today is through his word, through scripture. We already have a complete revelation of God. That's what the scripture is. The scripture is God's revelation of himself, of who he is, of his character, of his purpose, of his promises, of his power, of his, of his plans revealed to us through his word. His personality revealed to us through his word. God speaks to us through his word. He, we don't need to add anything else to this book. This book is all there is. These books, the scripture, the word of God. They, they are the revelation. They are the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit began to work through the minds of men who pen the pages that make up the Bible. They weren't writing on their own. The Bible is the breath of God that was breathed upon the, the, the writers of Scripture to pen the very words of God to you and I that we might know his truth. 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17, I, I, I made reference to it earlier. You've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood and you've been given the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. Paul's writing to Timothy, his son in the faith, and he says, all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful, useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. The Bible is, is God's authoritative, inspired word to us. The Holy Spirit inspired about 40 different authors from different periods of time and in different genres from history to poetry uh, and, 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 and prophecy. And you see all of these kinds of things and, and, and letters that have been penned in the New Testament and, and, and gospels and, and the history of the, of the book of Acts in the New Testament. And you, you see all of these things, prophecy in the book of Revelation. You see these different genres as the Holy Spirit begins to, to speak law. As he begins to speak and inspire and you see a single message weaved over time. The complete picture of God's revelation of himself to man, his character, his nature. Through the Bible, we are given direct access to God on a daily basis. Isn't that powerful? God wants to communicate with you. God wants to communicate with you. God communicates with us. He communicates with us through his word. Anybody ever heard the name Samuel Morris before? Samuel Morris before, he was an amazing artist. I know what we know him for, and I'll get to that. But before he got to that, he was an amazing artist. And what's interesting is, is what led to, to some of the discoveries was that, that he would paint portraits of, of important historical figures. Even some of the, the, the earliest presidents, the two first presidents of the United States. But all that changed in one short message. Samuel was painting a, a portrait of Marquise de Lafayette, a hero of the American Revolution. And he was in Washington, D.C. when a horse messenger had arrived to tell him uh, that, that his wife back home in New Haven, Connecticut was, was very sick. And so he immediately started packing up his stuff and, and he was desperate to return to her. But before he could even leave, another messenger arrived with a very devastating letter that his wife was dead. In fact, she had died before he had even received the first message he had found out. And so this, this was led to some heartbreak in his life. And he said, there's got to be a way to deliver news faster than by horse. And so he worked hard and he, he came up with two amazing inventions, the electrical telegraph and Morse code. The electrical telegraph sent Again, messages sent instantly over a wire that was stretched between two cities in the language Morris Code of dots and dashes that, that again, became a very common way of communicating. And his invention allowed for there to be messages from the East Coast to the West Coast, just like that. So we can thank, if you can text people today, that that, that really has its foundation in the other. 
Friends, I want to tell you that God wants to communicate to us. Frederick B. Meyer once said this, the written word is the wire. That's why I use that illustration. The wire along which the voice of God will certainly come to you if the heart is hushed and the attention is fixed. God wants to speak to us. And the primary way is through his word, through the Bible. The, the God's instruction and inspired word is a, a guide for the people. This isn't a new thing. I mean, way back, Joshua simply had what, what God had given Moses on that holy mountain, Mount Sinai, the law of God. That's what, that's what Joshua was given. And when Joshua took over leadership of the Israelites and, and he had a little bit of a, a fear of, 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 of taking over and, and, and were, were they going to be able to lead? Was he going to be able to lead? Could he, could he lead these people into the promised land? Could there, be, could there be something that could happen? God spoke these words to him and Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 7, only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn uh, from it to the right hand or the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. Now look at this. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. So that you may be careful to do all that is uh, all to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. What did God tell Joshua to do? Listen, meditate on my word. Meditate on my word. Let that, that word be in your heart. Let that word be in your mind. Let that word be before your eyes. Because if that word is in you, my word, if my word is before you, and if my word is in you, then you will know where to go. You will be directed. You will know which way to go. You won't turn to the right or to the left. Right? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Isn't that what the psalmist said? Right? And that's not new. That's because that is the Holy Spirit speaking through God's word. Friends, the Bible is just as much appropriate for us today as it was back then. It is not that outdated. It, it, it is not something that is archaic. The problem is, is that our mindset has changed away from God's word. We have gotten off track from God's word. Therefore, we want to filter everything through our own understanding. Through our own perspective. Because, you know, just like Adam and Eve, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So you don't have to listen and obey his word. You do whatever you want to do because he knows you'll be like him. Look how well that works for us. And yet every day, what's truth? What's truth? What's truth? It's my truth. I think this. I think that. You know what? There's a whole lot of people that think a whole lot of stuff and we're a whole lot of messed up because of it. Because we've gotten away from the word. We've gotten away from the word. Ooh, I'm going off now. I don't have time to read the word. But I have time to spend two and three hours scrolling through Facebook. And Instagram. I got two and three hours to put whatever my favorite news station is up on the TV or on the internet or wherever I go to for news these days. Because, you know, you can't trust this station and this station and this station. So I got to go here because this is the news source I trust. In the news I trust. That, that ought to be America's new slogan. Because that's the way we live. In Hollywood I trust. In New York I trust. Whatever some voice is telling me. In YouTube, I trust. In Facebook, I trust. Because, you know, that's a reputable source. For everybody's opinion but God's. And we wonder, how do I know, God, what direction I should go? When you don't spend any time in his word, you won't know what direction to go. You'll go whatever direction the person in your ear that you trust is speaking. And you know what? That is not always a good idea. But somehow, through the pages of Scripture, God reinforces things in our lives. The echoes of his voice go through the echoes of Scripture. Let me just 
share with you what I mean about how powerful Scripture is and how it speaks to you. I got off track a little bit. But John Bunyan, in his book, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, he shares a personal experience of, of how the Word of God spoke to him at a time when he was struggling and, and questioning. He writes this, One day I was traveling into the country, musing on the wickedness and blasphemy of my heart and considering the enmity that was in me to God. And that scripture came to mind, Colossians 1.20, having made peace with God through the blood of his cross, by which I was made to see both again and again, I love this, this is powerful, that God and my soul were friends by his blood. Yea, I saw the justice of God and my sinful soul could embrace and kiss each other through his blood. This was a good day to me. I hope I shall not forget it. You ever found yourself struggling with something? Wrestling with something? Just really struggling. And then you, 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 you open up the Bible and you, you're reading and there's a verse of scripture that just, wow, it just speaks to your heart. It's just something that encourages you. You read something and all of a sudden there's a reinforcement of, of God's promise that comes. Or, or maybe you are scrolling and somebody posts a scripture and you're like, man, that is just what I needed to hear. God's word speaks to us. It's powerful to us. It gives us assurance and, and it reminds us. As God speaks to us through his word. I want to just close with this quote. And then we'll move on to the second one. Dr. Charles Stanley writes this. Through his word he directs us. Challenges us. Warns us. Comforts us. Assures us. I have found it to be one of the most rewarding experiences in my Christian life. To face a challenge and meditate upon the word until I know he has spoken to me. There is power in God's word. I can't encourage it enough that if you want to hear from God, if you want to be attuned to his voice, you've got to be in his word. You've got to be in the scripture in his word. And you say, but I don't, I, I struggle sometimes to understand the Bible. I struggle sometimes to, to understand. Well, that's, that's because you need number two. Another way the Holy Spirit or the way that God speaks to us is through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. In fact, that's the primary way that, that God had spoken through Jesus and that God spoke to the New Testament disciples was through the Holy Spirit. And God still speaks to our spirits today through the Holy Spirit that, that lives and dwells and abides in us. Jesus affirmed the importance of the Holy Spirit's role when he was speaking to his disciples just prior to his arrest and, and, and then his resurrection. He said this, John 14, 26, but when the Father sends the advocate or the comforter or the helper as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything that I have told you. Let's not forget that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is as much God as Jesus is God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit's role is to, to allow us to be able to hear the words of the Father and to illuminate to us who Jesus is. And we'll talk about it at the end. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then John 1 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we know that Jesus is the Word, and the Holy Spirit reveals the Word to us, right? And in and, and fact, John 16 15, Jesus said, This all that belongs to the Father is mine. That's why I said, The Spirit will tell you whatever He receives from me. You say, I want to hear from Jesus. Guess what? You've got to be attuned to the Spirit who lives in you because the Spirit speaks to your heart what Jesus says, what the Father says. That's the role in the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to help us to hear what the Father says. And as followers of Jesus, you and I, uh, through the Holy Spirit, have access to a supernatural GPS. Right? You don't, you don't need, you don't need, you know, Apple directions or, you know, hey Siri or hey Google to figure out your way. Sometimes you need to say, hey, Holy Spirit. Hey, Holy Spirit. We don't need Alexa. We need the Holy Spirit. I know that one might have gone over the head. That's Amazon's little thing there. You know, they have all these names now, you know, Siri and Google and Alexa and everything else. God already gave us that. 
the Holy Spirit through promptings and through doors that he opens and, 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 and desires that he puts inside that are godly desires that the Holy Spirit speaks to us in amazing ways. Oftentimes not in that audible voice, but that inner voice of his spirit speaking to our spirit and bearing witness to our spirit. And friends, if we walk in the spirit daily, surrendered to his power, we have the right to expect anything that we can hear, that we can hear from God. We have the right to expect that we can hear from God. The Holy Spirit within us speaking to us is, is, is not often natural to us, it, but it ought to be a natural, normal lifestyle for every believer. We can claim his presence and direction and guidance. G. Campbell Morgan writes this, to the individual believer indwelt by the Holy Spirit, there is granted the direct impression of the Spirit of God and the Spirit of man, imparting knowledge of his will in matters of the smallest and greatest importance. This has to be sought for and waited for. Friends, you and I have been given the Holy Spirit who will illuminate the word of God and his his guidance does not go against God's word. It is not contrary to scripture, but ought to lead and be affirmed by scripture. As such, number three, the third way that God speaks is God speaks his word through other people. God speaks his word through other people. If you did not believe that, you wouldn't be sitting here today listening to me drone on and on. There's a whole lot of other places you can be and a whole lot of other places other people already are. Right? Right? I know, some of you watching online, you wouldn't be tuned in today <laughs> if you didn't believe this. But throughout the Bible, we see that. We see God speaking through other people. We, we saw it when there was a, a prophet by the name of, of Nathan who came and, and confronted a king by the name of David. Right? We, we, we see it. We see it when, a, when a, a, a guy who was named Uncle Mordecai came and, and he spoke a word to his Niece Esther, who just happened to be queen in a very Gentile kingdom, and said, perhaps God has placed you for such a time as this. God used Paul to encourage a young man by the name of Timothy. In fact, one of the things that, that is fulfilled in the New Testament, as the, as the Spirit would oftentimes fall just simply upon individual people at an individual time. And yet, when God was working through Moses, and, 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 and it, 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 Moses, Moses was, was, was needing some help and leadership. And God said, I want you to appoint 70 elders. And he said, I'm going to take the spirit that I put on you and I'm going, to, I'm going to put it on these 70 elders. That same spirit that's on you on the 70 elders. And 68 of them came and two of them showed up late to the party. They were, you know, obviously they were fine church going people uh, late to the church. And, 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 and they were a little bit late. And, and the spirit was poured out on the 68, but just not on the 68. Eldad and Medad, the two that were late, we get their names. We don't get the others. And they started prophesying. And I believe it was Joshua that heard them and he was zealous. And he said, what do we do? I hear they're prophesying too. Should I, should I kill them? And Moses made this statement. He said, I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets. And you see that. In the last days, that in the time when Jesus had come, when he had poured out his spirit, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Friends, the Holy Spirit speaks to us and the Holy Spirit speaks through other people to us. 1 Corinthians 2.13 13, Paul wrote these words about, uh, he, he, he wrote these words, uh, we impart God's truth. I'm, I'm sorry, we impart God's truth. In, in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Paul is saying, listen, we, what, what we're speaking to you, we're imparting to you truth that we, have, that we have heard from God. God's truth, words not taught by human wisdom, but by the Spirit. This is what we have, that, that God had mediated and divinely taught taught through, through, through people, taught words of God to others. God's word meditated on and divinely taught. God's word comes to us in human words. And to the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he writes this, 
And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us. So they received the word of God, but how did they hear it? Did they hear it directly from God? No, they heard it through Paul and his team. You heard from us, you accepted it, not as the words of men, but as it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you as believers. So we know in, in there that God speaks to us through his word, through the scripture. We know that God speaks through his Holy Spirit. And we also know that God can speak through other people who, who he has given a word to us. Others who, who speak and share. And that one always gets us. We're always a little like, what, really? Well, we got to be careful. And you do, you do have to be careful of those things. But again, divinely, that's why we have God's word. That's why we have the Bible. Because you, you, you mark everything that someone shares to you as to whether it identifies and whether it lines up with the word of God. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, it's not God's word. But sometimes it's tough for us to hear from God on our own. Sometimes we read and we can't get it. Sometimes we're in a situation and things are just overwhelming and we have a hard time understanding it. God will encourage us by speaking a word to us through other people. And, 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 and we, have to, we have to discern those things. Why? Because I gotta be honest with you. You know, sometimes people mean well, but what they're reading is not really discerning God's word they're discerning their own desires or perhaps your desires. How do I know this to be true? Because I know that God speaks through, through, through others. I mean, here, here is Jesus and he's asking the disciples on one occasion, who do you say that, who do people say that I am? And they said, some say you're a good teacher and some say you're a prophet and, 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 and all of this. And then he says to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, because he, he says to him, this was not revealed to you by men. It's revealed to you by God. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So then Jesus, upon that word, that word that is true, that word that has been affirmed, that word that is true, he then begins to tell them, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be crucified. And, I, and, and I'm, I, I, I'm, they're, they're going to kill me. They're, you know, I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to suffer. And Peter takes him aside right? And rebukes him. And he says, you're not going to suffer. Don't say things like that. You're not going to suffer. And what does Jesus say to him? Jesus, in, in Matthew 16, 23, rebuked Peter saying, turn to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You're dangerous trapped to me. You're seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. God speaks through people, but if it does not line up with his word, you best not walk in it. You best not walk in it. I believe in prophecy and I believe that God speaks through people. And I believe that God can speak through people to encourage us and to challenge us and to help confirm what God has already been speaking to us through his word. But I also know that sometimes we can get caught up in what we desire and that prophecy can be something more along the lines of reading our own desires or reading the desires of somebody that we're talking to rather than being the voice of God. That's why we have to, to line everything up. God does speak, but God has given us discernment and we need to weigh everything according to his word. Is this consistent with what his word says? Is this consistent with what his word says? Let me give you an example. I'm gonna give you another example. I didn't write in my notes. I was kind of shying away from it, but I'm not gonna shy away from it. I'm just going for it. So if I get in trouble, I get in trouble. I, 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 I you know, you sometimes, sometimes you, you know, you, you have people and, and, you know, and, 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 and trust me, God, uh, they, they believe that God wants us to be happy. I firmly believe God doesn't care about your happiness as much as he does about your holiness. And you will have greater peace and joy if you walk in his holiness. But we have this misconception that God wants us to be happy. And so sometimes I'll have people who are living together, who are fornicating, who are having sex before marriage and who are living together, who will say to me, but see, I was in a bad relationship and this is God's word. And I just really, 
This is God wanting me to be happy, and God brought this person into my life, and God, God wants me to be happy. Yet God's word says that, that we are not to be sexually impure. We are, we are not to be sexually immoral. We're, we're, we're right? That, that yet sex is deserved for, resigned for marriage under the covenant of marriage. I don't want to get married. We just want to live together and all that. And, you know, we're getting these benefits from the government and all of this. And I, that do that will ruin all the benefits that we have and ruin my retirement and ruin this and ruin that and ruin that. Well, do you trust God or not? Is the government your provider or is God your provider? I told you I was going to step in it. Because we want our own desires, but we don't want, us, we don't want to, to crucify the desires of the flesh to follow the desires of God's word. And we want to make it that this is God's word. Well, God wants me to be happy. Well, you know, God's a God of love. God's also a God of justice and holiness and righteousness. But who are we listening to? The voices of our culture that tell us that that's okay and that that's normal. Because, you know, when you look around, if this is normal, it's really working well for us, isn't it? It's working well for families, isn't it? It's working well for marriages, isn't it? This normal? Whatever we hear, we've got to filter through the word of God. It cannot be just our own desires. If you say you've heard from God, but it doesn't line up with God's word, you haven't heard from God. You're hearing another voice, and it isn't the voice of God. It might be the voice of your flesh that you have yet to crucify. Whew, okay. Friends, we need to understand God wants to speak to us. And he has given us his word. Hearing his word in the echoes of his voice is something that is, is truly crucial. So let me land the plane. John chapter 1. This is what I want to, uh, these are the powerful words. I quoted it before. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him, uh, not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And, and this is the way it opens. That in the beginning was the word. And we already, we already said, as we, as we, we you know, John 1, 14, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We know that what he's talking about is Jesus. That Jesus is the word. That, that at the very beginning of creation, Jesus is the word. The very beginning of creation, when God said, let there be light, it was Jesus. Let there be light. It was God's word. There's power in the word. And the word, there is life. And that life is the light of men. We already know that about the, the word. The word is Jesus. Jesus is the word. And because we have the word, we have the very words and character and person of Jesus. Dallas Willard writes this, the word of God when no further qualification is added is his speaking, his communicating. When God speaks, he expresses his mind, his character, and his purposes. Thus, God is always present with his word. Isn't that awesome? That's an awesome reality that God is always present where his word is. God is always present. And going back to John 1, Jesus is the word. It's all about the revelation, the life, and the light of men. And yet John 1, 10, and 11 says this, and this is what I want to close with today. He, meaning Jesus, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. How sad is that? God's word to the world. The word that the the word that, 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 that made the world, that the world was made through the hope and the light of life that was present. And yet, they had it, but they did not receive it. They did not receive it. Here's the question. Will you receive his word today? Will you receive the word today? God wants to speak to you. But the question is, will you receive it? Worship team, will you come? Because here's what verse 12 says. 
But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. To all who did receive him. You see, God loves us. God speaks to us in a number of different ways. And he wants to be an active part of our lives through scripture, through his Holy Spirit. As he speaks through others to us, God is speaking intimately and desires to speak to us today. He speaks to us through his word and he came. But the question is, will we receive him? Will we receive him? Receive him. Scripture does not change, right? He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yesterday, today, and forever, right? So the question is, will we receive, receive him? Will you choose today to read, meditate on the word of God, to listen to the Holy Spirit, and let God speak to your heart today? Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anyone you're here today? Maybe you've not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. Maybe you have been walking in sin and the Lord has spoken to you. And maybe the Lord has convicted you and told you that, that he wants to forgive you of your sin. That he wants to cleanse you. That he wants you to receive the salvation that he offers today. I beg you today, listen and receive the word of God. If that's you today and you need to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Will you slip up your hand today if you're in here? If you're online, will you let us know in the comments? I need to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior today. Anyone at all, I want to receive Jesus, the Word. I need to receive Jesus, my Lord and Savior today. Hallelujah. Secondly, maybe you're here today and, and you just say, Jesus, I need you to speak to me. You just need a word from the Lord today. Maybe it's something in His Word that is speaking. Maybe... Maybe today you need to courage like the, the centurion to just take God at his word today. Whatever it is, you'd say, Pastor, will you pray for me? I just need to take God at his word today. I need to hear God's word. I need God's word today. Anyone at all? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you that you speak to us through your word. We thank you today that you are good and that you, you speak to us through your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would let the word of God come alive and bear witness in our heart. That we would hear from you and hear your voice. For those that need a word, that those that need the courage to take you at your word, that need the faith to take you at your word. I just pray for an infusion of faith. For someone that needs to, that's discouraged and needs to get a word from you. I pray, Lord, for a word from you today. I pray a word from you today in their lives. Father, we thank you. And bless you today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us. In Jesus' name, amen.